Hi everybody, my name is Scott Holstein with CompuTrolls. I am joined today by Phil Zito on our Building Technology Podcast. Phil is one of the better known, better known names in the building automation industry, uh, known for his Building Automation Monthly website. Um, he has tons and tons of awesome information on building automation. Uh, it's basically you know, a, a resource for videos, podcasts, um, blogs, you name it. Um, but Phil is the fastest growing provider of online training for building automation. And uh, we're very excited to have him here today. Phil, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Scott. It's great to be here. Phil, I got to say, you know, uh, as somebody who's been in the building automation industry just three years now, I was very appreciative of Building Automation Monthly as a resource uh, because I really came into the industry looking for information, looking to learn, and found there wasn't a lot of content out there. Um, so, you know, it was it was a huge help to me, and I'm sure it's been a huge help to a lot of other folks in the building automation industry. Um, you know, how have things been going with Building Automation Monthly? How's how's the business going, and uh, and where where do you see it headed? Yeah, so way better than I ever thought it was going to go. I mean, I never envisioned this to become a training company. Otherwise, I would have picked a different name than Building Automation Monthly. It kind of confuses <laughs> people. <laughs> So, but, uh, you know, it just, it started off as a way for me to document my research. So I've only been in the industry 12 years. A lot of folks don't realize that they, for some reason, maybe it's because I'm balding and I got a gray beard, but, uh, for whatever reason, they think I'm much older than I actually am. They're like, Hey, what controls line did you work on in the eighties? I was like, I was two years old in the eighties. So, uh, not, not many. Uh, but, you know, I came in too, like you, with only the Honeywell Gray Manual. I had a mentor who gave me a control stencil, like literally a stencil, a piece of plastic, and had me write my programs on a piece of paper before he'd let me program anything. And so I learned a lot. You know, I learned the art of Google Foo. And, you know, in this industry, you got to be able to research stuff. And so... Building Automation Monthly kind of became my uh, resting place for all those thoughts. And no one else was out there doing it at the time. And it turned into more than just uh, a resource for me to share information. started having a lot of people asking me for more information. So I put a book together and a podcast together and our first course together, which was on IT. Folks then uh, were trying to figure out IT controls at the time. Everyone rolled out IP controls. Um, and was like, hey, IP controls is a thing to do. A lot of folks don't realize the reason IP controls kind of became mainstream was because there were some manufacturers who got their IP controls lines flat spec, and that was excluding other manufacturers. And so it's kind of that, oh, crap, we're losing jobs. We better get an IP product, too. And so it came out, that's kind of how IP controls came about. And our IT course at the time was there and nothing else was there. So folks started buying that and we turned into a full-time training business. And, you know, since then, since 2017, November 2017, when we uh, became an LLC, we've had 4,200 students go through. We've created eight courses. We've worked with pretty much all of the major OEMs and a lot of the system integration companies, um, as well as a lot of owner organizations and consulting engineers. So now our focus, uh, as we're starting to close out our technical tracks, so we've got a track focused on technicians, designers, programmers, and new construction sales, and we're wrapping up a track focused on integration, service operations, and project management. Once those are done, kind of around summertime, we're then going to be switching our focus on the owner operators because I feel like that is a very underserved market um, as far as training goes. Um, your options usually are, you know, a $99 um, slide share presentation, um, often presented by someone who hasn't actually worked in controls. And uh, I feel that that's very limiting to operators. I feel like they're a very neglected segment of our industry. And, 
that's what we're looking to focus on, shifting our business to focus on towards the end of this year. Probably for a good six months, we'll be producing course content related to that market. Well, that's great. And, uh, you know, I, I noticed um, I noticed earlier this week, I think you had posted something on LinkedIn, which is which was what needs to be included in a BAS operator course. And uh, I love when you ask those questions on LinkedIn because you, you generally get a lot of engagement because of your network. And uh, I feel like you get great feedback based on that. And, uh, you know, the operator is really you know somebody that Com controls focuses on as a company, and I think um, you know I think training operators is something like you said it's done on a case by case basis, and then as you have turnover and things change, um, it doesn't always get passed along. So the uh, the operator, the individual is also uh, a, a, it's a case by case basis as well. You have operators who are really familiar with HVAC systems. You have operators who have no experience there. Um, and then you have operators who are really good in the IT space, very technical, good with the software side of things, but maybe not the mechanical side. So what have you learned in your research for this course? I mean, I saw a lot of great responses to that LinkedIn post, but what have you learned so far? Yeah, so that was really interesting. You know, I did a post on LinkedIn. I did a post on Facebook. I haven't sent anything out to our email list yet, but I'm going to be doing that. Um, something we do when we create all our courses is we do a beta. And I don't mean this to be an infomercial for our courses. So the, the reason I'm giving folks who are listening to this, this background is because it'll kind of help kind of paint the picture of the conundrum I'm in creating an operator course. But whenever we create a course, we do a beta. We actually open it up for a discounted price, and we don't actually create the course. We bring in students before we've created the course, and then we create the course alongside the students, and they give us feedback as we create the course. Well, as I started to solicit feedback on LinkedIn and Facebook, which is kind of step one of our strategy, we first see if folks respond to see if there's even interest. Um, then we take their feedback and we try to lump it up together. And what I got was actually quite confusing because there was a lot of different feedback. Some of the feedback I thought was, quite frankly, overkill. I mean, there were folks who were, oh, well, they need to understand how to do complex engineering. And I'm like, this is operators. Operators. We're not talking facility engineers, operators. So. What I noticed is that there wasn't a consensus on what an operator should do. Uh, it seemed to break out based on if the operator is part of, you know, a institutional organization like a school or a higher ed or a municipality. And then there's operators for private entities like corporate campuses. And then there's operators for, you know, investment real estate like strip malls and medical office buildings and small scale commercial real estate. And they seem to to have no clear definition on what an operator was. So that was the first insight. Um, the second set of insight was that there was a lot of legacy systems that operators are currently operating that no longer are supported by manufacturers. And as soon as these operators decide to retire, you can't buy these parts off eBay anymore. So there seemed to be, you know, how do you even train that? Because you're going to have an operator who's saying, I'm not interested in training because I already know this stuff. But you can't go and train a new person really on a product that ultimately has a two, three year lifespan and you can't replace. So there's the conundrum. You know, what do you train that person on? Because you don't want to train them on a new product because you don't know what they're going to use, but you can't train them on the existing product because that product's obsolete and you're wasting investment dollars. So that was the, the second thing. And then the third, and this kind of last point I'll make, was just this shift that is occurring from capital investment and in resources to operational investment. Seeing a lot of organizations that are choosing to use service providers and 
The reason why is that it's a operational cost that they can contract if they hit a bad time or they're not revenueing or a tenant moves out and they've got, you know, empty space. They don't have someone on staff. They just contract that contract. So, you know, that operational cost can be load shed really fast versus a capital cost of investing in the employee, hiring the employee, training the employee, keeping the employee. We're seeing a lot of mid-size and smaller organizations that are avoiding that model, actually. Very interesting. And, um, you know, something that you brought up that, uh, yeah, I had thought about myself previously was it is interesting to see the different levels of operators in various industries. Um, you know, you, you brought up higher education and commercial real estate as two of them. And those are two that I've seen kind of the opposite end of the spectrum on. Um, and then you look at healthcare, where, you know, you feel like maybe you need to have somebody on staff who really does have that high high touch because um, healthcare is held to such a high standard um, for you know all of those HVAC purposes. Um, mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with you know that broad range, you know how do you how do you start to position um, your training for for someone who has that experience versus somebody who doesn't maybe. Yeah, so that's a dilemma, right? Uh, that's something we've been racking our brains on. And I think what I've concluded from this is it's going to be kind of a multi-tier training structure. There's going to be an entry level, which is a familiarity training. Then there's going to be an actual process-specific training that sits on top of that. So I, I think the familiarity training will help a lot of folks. And then what I did was I mapped out the use cases that the majority of operators will do. They got to log into the building automation system. They got to change set points. They got to view alarms. They got to create schedules. And then you get to the more complex use cases, which are you know changing graphics, reloading controllers, etc. So when you start to figure out those use cases you can then go and start to actually structure a training path. And whereas most of our courses for technicians and designers and programmers are kind of omnibus programs, they're you know, 33 hours long, all encompassing. These courses, I'm envisioning them being much shorter and being modularized so that it will be applicable to that kind of very broad definition of what an operator is. Gotcha. Um, something else that you had mentioned that uh, I think is something that I'm sure a lot of property managers struggle with is, you know, is it is it train in house or is it not? So, can you talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages you found in uh, in doing your research on this? Yeah, so whether to train in-house or not to train in-house um, is a good question. And it also depends on, is this part of an existing project or is this just an ongoing decision? Because one of, the, one of the strategies that your listeners can implement right now is if they have a project ongoing, they can get very clear on the use cases that they want their operators to execute. What I mean by that is they can say, I want my operator to be able to log in. I want them to be able to check all the room temps. I want them to be able to check alarms, to print a report on temperatures, um, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever those use cases are, spend an hour or two, document out those use cases. And, and I don't want the phrase use cases to be intimidating to anyone. A use case can be as simple as saying, log into the BAS and check temperature. You don't have to get any more detailed than that. But what you do is you list out these use cases. You work with your contractor who's actually putting in the new or retrofitting the existing building automation system. And then you work these use cases into the training that should be in your spec. You should be specking 8 to 16 hours of training. Um, and then once that's built into the spec, you actually videotape that training. When it occurs, you store it on a, on a server locally or in the cloud. And then as new people come on board or as people need to be refreshed, 
They simply go view that recorded training and you've basically created a training library. And I think we need to get away from the mindset of we have one person who has all this tacit knowledge and we need to focus in on kind of a continuous training model where we're building that knowledge, utilizing the tools available to us like cloud and uh, data storage to create a training library. Now, that's an easy decision to make if you're doing new construction or retrofit work. But what if you're doing just operating a building? Well, in that case, it really comes down to a revenue decision. Are you going to be able to avoid, and, and it's less of a, does it cost less for me to train my ops team than to use an integrator or a contractor? That's not the question you should be asking. The question you should be asking is, is the likelihood of a system failure occurring that if I trained my team, they could address faster than potentially the contractor who's servicing me? And is the benefit of that faster response or preventative response going to generate enough positive revenue in my business that I should invest in that. So an example of that would be a school district. If students aren't in their seats, then you don't get paid that day for student attendance because they're not attending. So having someone who decouples you from relying on a contractor to service you in-house, so having someone trained in-house who can go and solve the majority of those issues, in my opinion, makes sense from a profit perspective. That's how I look at these problems. It's a little different than looking at does it cost, because that first cost of training someone is going to easily be eclipsed by the damage to your business profitability if for four days students aren't sitting in their chairs or if you have to go, you're maybe running a, a test lab in a production facility, and you have to restart a one-year test because the environment went out of control, those kind of things. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my next question, um, was how do you determine what those use cases are? And, it, it, you know, from what you explained, you know, my perception is that uh, – it depends. It depends on the, the facility. It depends on who you have in place um, and and what you can realistically do in-house. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, you, you look at the business case for it. Um, you know, if, if I have to call somebody to do this, what is it going to cost me um, from a business perspective? And then what is the monetary cost of getting out, you know, getting someone out here um, for maintenance as well? Um, I really do like the idea of, you know, having some kind of training library because I do think that oftentimes that training does not get passed down as, you know, turnover happens or um, whatever that might be. So I think, you know, figuring out what those use cases are and then building some kind of training library for those use cases is a really great start. Um, yeah. You know, as, as, as we talk about passing things down, um, to the next guy, um, we we see in the facility management uh, industry right now a a shift. Uh, you know, a lot of those individuals um, who are retiring, uh, not necessarily. You know, there's not really a workforce or a, a skilled workforce there to replace them at this point. Um, so, is is the library and you know the training that goes into that? Is that something um, that you see getting passed down? And then um, on that. On the same, along the same lines, you, know, you had brought up earlier legacy systems um, who are run by these individuals who who may be on their way out. You know, how do you how do you recommend managing that situation? Okay. So, first question: How do you go and manage technical knowledge? How do you pass that down? You know, I mean, there's kind of a running joke right now in the building automation industry, which is that if you're breathing and you can spell BAS, you can get a job. I mean, it's not not quite that bad, but it's it's pretty bad. Anyone who wants to work is working, and if you're getting an experienced person, um, you're either paying them a huge premium or they're not really as good as they say they are because folks aren't leaving companies right now. There's just so much backlog. The same is to be said about operators. 
Now, we have to get a little clearer, though, on the definition of an, of an operator. If we're talking about a janitor who flips a switch in a mechanical closet to turn the building on and off, that's probably not the audience we're targeting here. We're looking right. at more folks, and, and we're also not looking at folks who are at the university level who have a mechanical engineering degree, have been to every manufacturer training course, have their own controls team, and are using interns to run a remote operation center. I mean, those are kind of two extreme examples. We're looking at something more in the middle of someone who is multi-talented, maybe has a mechanical background, maybe doesn't, maybe has an electrical background, maybe doesn't. But their sole goal is to come in in the morning, make sure the building's running, make sure nothing is out of whack. And if something is out of whack, try to initially figure out why it is and maybe do some generic level troubleshooting. That is your typical operator profile. So how do you train to that? Well, you can do that pretty consistently across multiple different verticals because you're thinking, right, life, safety, comfort, and efficiency. Those are your three kind of outcomes, life, safety, comfort, efficiency. Um, and you could also th throw in uh, business processes as well. So, you know, life safety being, hey, are the lights on? Is the, you know, infectious control room in the hospital, is it properly pressurized? So, you know, infection and whatever viruses floating around isn't escaping into other rooms. So that's life safety. You know, business process would be making sure that the OR is at the right temperature so that we can actually do surgeries or make sure that the imaging room is at the right temperature so we can run the MRI machine and make profit. And then you've got, you know, actual comfort, making sure everyone's comfortable and your effectiveness of your equipment, making sure it's running well. So once you've got those kind of four areas focused in on, then it's pretty easy to generate the use cases and build a training library around those. You would go and say, okay, to do this, what do I need to do? Well, as I mentioned, you need to be able to log in the system, you need to be able to check the variables, you need to be able to run reports, you need to be able to do some basic level troubleshooting. So then you build use cases around that, you get your training around that, you build that training library. Now, when you're looking at existing buildings with legacy systems, which just to define what a legacy system is, because we hear that term thrown around so much, legacy system is a system that is no longer in production and that you can no longer buy parts for. It's legacy. It is a system that is no longer around. And a lot of these systems exist. Um, you've got pneumatic systems, which are pressurized air. You've got old electromechanical systems, and you've got some first-generation DDC systems. So what do you do with those? Well, um, you've got kind of three options. I know you guys specialize in the integration option, so you've got that piece. Um, that's one option to do. Other option is rip and replace. Um, in some cases, that makes sense. You know, if you've got an old pneumatic system that's leaking all over the place and uh, you want to move to a DDC system, that may make sense of ripping and replacing that. Um, and then your third is kind of a hybrid option, which is kind of maybe top-level integration and leave the existing system in place. And then as those fail off. But, you know, you've got that talent there that has all that tacit knowledge. And the thing is, is that what we don't realize is that tacit knowledge is often product-specific knowledge. So even if you were to capture that and train someone on that tacit knowledge, you're training them on knowledge that isn't really applicable to any other system. So I think you need to go a level higher than that. You know, rather than saying, okay, this is the old teletrol system, this is how you you know, use COM port whatever to go and telnet into it and, you know, use your green screen to mess around with it. Instead of doing that, maybe train people on what actual points are. What's a physical point? What's a logical point? What's a graphic? How do I even turn on a computer? Um, I mean, I got this one call back when I was in service. It was kind of funny. I had this guy and he's like, I can't get six. I've got 60 HZ on my screen. I can't get it to go away. I've restarted the BAS and everything. Well, it turns out he was in monitor configuration mode. 
um, on his monitor. <laughs> and so he turned off the monitor and turned it on. And for at least a couple seconds, I was the smartest technician in the world to him because I was able to figure out it was on his monitor. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, that's just, there's no fault on people like that. I'm not at all demeaning that. I've met many folks who can't operate uh, a computer, but yet know a way more about mechanical systems than I possibly ever could. So we each have our strengths. It's just simply knowing where your team is at, training your team to that baseline level, whatever you decide it to be, but not focusing on that existing system and that tacit knowledge, because the likelihood is for every dollar you invest in someone learning that, the likelihood of that dollar paying off is becoming less and less as the systems age. So the ROI on that investment of knowledge is not very high. So, uh, so something that you've kind of alluded to a little bit is, um, you know, that, that, that not that you don't necessarily have to have, you know, all of this knowledge to, to get started in, in being more proactive about managing the building automation system in your facility. I think, I think a lot of, uh, facility managers out there do, 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 are intimidated to some degree to go and get their hands dirty and, and actually start, um, start kind of tweaking things and, and moving things around. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, you hear a lot of the, the jargon thrown around, um, you know, the, the IOT and, and um, artificial intelligence. And I think that, that a lot of that is off-putting to, to people who are not necessarily comfortable with the building automation system to begin with. So, how do you how do you make those individuals feel comfortable enough to get started? Uh yeah. So I mean first off, you got to accept that you're never going to know everything. Um you're always going to meet someone who knows more. So the question is when do I know enough? And that's why I always bring it back to the use cases. Do you know enough to do the use cases? If you don't know enough to do the use cases, who does know how to do the use cases? And then go to that person or persons and find out what they know that you don't know. So if I was looking to log into a building automation system, and I said, that's one of my use cases. And my other use case is to change temperature. I don't think you need to know all the jargon or even know what a building automation system is to know that you can log into it and see the temperatures in your room. I think that's fairly common knowledge. So knowing that, the question then becomes, how do I log in and see the temperatures in my room? Now, that is a question we can answer. And you can answer that by going to manufacturer training, you can answer that by asking the manufacturer to just swing by and give you a quick overview. You can answer that by building it into your training in a new construction or existing retrofit project. There's so many ways to address it. You just have to decide how you want to address it. The thing is, is what you don't want to do is say, okay, I need to know every single thing about this building automation system. I'm a big fan of just-in-time learning. Um, it's how we set up our business model is that's the reason we do online courses. That's the reason our courses are asynchronous, meaning they're pre-recorded, is because we want folks to be able to hop into a lesson and say, oh, I need to do this. And so they hop into that lesson, like in our install course. Oh, I need to set up an input. Or, oh, I need to set up a trend. And they hop in and they watch that video. I'm a big fan of that. And I think that's the model that operators should be focusing on. What are the key use cases they need to do? And then as they need to do them, either refer to an existing training library or go and seek out the resources. And when you take that approach, I, I feel that in my experience working with our students, learning building automation becomes much more reasonable. It becomes much easier to approach that because it's not this overwhelming beast of, I've got to learn everything about everything. It's I need to learn how to turn on my computer, log in, and check a set point. And that is much easier than I need to learn every aspect of the BAS. 
I think that's a great approach. Uh, I think baby steps are definitely the way to go. Uh, like you said, figure out what those first few use, use cases are. Get get the individuals comfortable with checking the temperature, changing the schedule, really, really basic, you know, pick, pick a handful of things that you want to learn how to do, learn how to do those. And uh, I think, honestly, a lot of people are going to get in there. It's going to be easier than they expected. And from there, that you know, they they may they may get a little bit more interested and want to poke around and do a little bit more. And then as those service calls come up, they're you know they might have an interest in okay, well, how did you do that? So next time I can do that. Um, so I, I think that's a, a great way to start. Yeah, and and it's less overwhelming. And I mean that's something literally your listeners could do right now. They could pause this and write down five things they've done with their BAS this week. And then they've created five use cases. And then all they have to do is remember those five things when they come up to a new retrofit or a new project or when their service tech comes to visit their site and say, hey, can you show me how to do this? And then if they're really feeling, you know, really ambitious, they grab a, their iPhone and record it while it's being done and then save that video to the cloud or save it to a local server. And there you go. And then they're like, oh, I got to remember how to log in and configure that point or change that setting. Well, oh, I remember I got a video and I'll watch the video again. And I mean, that literally that five minutes of them recording that will avoid a three hour service call potentially. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then they look like a hero. Um, so, uh, Phil, I really appreciate you take, taking the time to, uh, to sit down and talk to us today. I think, you know, there's a lot of really good takeaways from this. Um, everybody listening, please uh, keep an eye out for Phil's operator course coming out. If you haven't already, go to Building Automation Monthly, see Phil's content. It's second to none in terms of education for the building automation industry. I highly recommend it myself. Bill, thanks again for the time, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on the podcast some other time. Yeah, thanks for having me.